Welcome back to the channel, guys. Today I am talking to Sebastian Gronda from Denmark. Sebastian decided against his favorite hero, Katsu, and actually into the tournament in the Calling Birmingham with Bravo. So welcome, Sebastian. I'm really stoked to see you again. How are you doing? Thank you, man. It's really good to be here. It's been a long time, man. What, half a year ago that we saw each other? So it's, it's nice to see you again. Man. It's nice to see you again, too. I'm always really stoked to talk to you. And especially when after a tournament where you crushed a lot of games. The last time actually on the, the channel where last year's calling in Utrecht, where you won the European Champions Battle, where all the national champions from around Europe were getting on and you were the winner of that tournament with your Fi deck. A lot of things have changed, but uh, yeah. Remember back to that tournament, it was pretty crazy. Oh yeah, it was a lot of fine, a lot of prison, and all the fires just beat up the prisons. What a day. And nobody had you on the radar before that, but afterwards, like, I remember the your fire deck was so fire, and everybody was actually pretty new on fire, so it was really interesting to see for many players how you turned out the deck and how it's working. So are you still playing fire today from time to time? Not really. I have a tendency to get very bored with decks that I have played a lot. So I tend to switch around from deck to deck a lot in Flesh and Blood because it keeps me, keeps the novelty, keeps me interested in the game. So it's also why I generally like drafting quite a bit because you have a different deck every time and it keeps the novelty of the game. I don't play Fi that much right now. I'm playing a lot of slower classes like a Guardian or Mechanology or Assassin right now to try that part of the game out. Played a lot of Oldham right before he went up. Yeah, I witnessed when Oldham, yeah, needed to go at least here in Europe for the last big tournament. And it was actually Pablo Pintor that you had a quite similar list in the calling Birmingham. But uh, did you, before we come to the calling, yeah, how did you follow around with Flesh and Blood this year? Did you watch the last big tournaments? Yeah, every time there is coverage, basically every time I watch like the whole thing. Because I feel like just watching Flesh and Blood is something you can do when you're just relaxing. And then you still get a lot out of it because you still keep updated on all the decks on all the different players and you, you see things that you wouldn't have otherwise experienced in flesh and blood and to be an up-to-date good player i think that is very necessary because you need to follow the medic and you need to understand how things are developing because um yeah, that's a whole other thing when you're a good player in different card games the way that you are a good player is that you understand how to counter the meta or build a deck that is revolving around the meta right now so yeah i have been Definitely following around with the Flesh and Blood, even though I haven't been at the, the large tournaments this year. So is it that you, for yourself, enjoy watching the gameplays from a strategic standpoint, but also because you want to see which players are actually playing in these tournaments at the moment? Definitely both of them. The strategic point, I really enjoy like watching games and then thinking about if I could have made a better line in them, or I think the player took the correct line. Because I think there is a lot to learn, especially with heroes that you don't regularly play, trying to understand why a player is doing the things that they're doing in a game. So I think that is very good about like watching coverage. And there has been a lot of good coverage yeah. this year. So that is really great for Flesh and Blood. And then also just, yeah, the relaxing part and the, watching the names that you already know, seeing how they can keep up with the reputation of their name and then watching new players get into, into fame. So is there any particular person that you have a spotlight on when watching the tournaments at the moment? I feel like I'm always having a spotlight on pa Pablo. Always. Every single time you're watching out for Pablo. Just, is he playing another Guardian again? And is he going to fatigue people? And uh, the answer turns out to be almost certainly yes. But yeah, generally watch out for him. And then Brody Spurlock. I don't know what it is about that guy, but he has some mentality for this game. Like he plays so many games. And I assume he watches a lot of coverage as well. And he analyzes things in a way that a lot of players don't. And he's very dedicated. I admire that. And I know a lot of people that I know as well admire that a lot. I don't know how he finds the time for the games, but he does it. And it's incredible. Yeah, definitely. It's very time consuming, as you say, to be one of the top players in Flesh and Blood. But how do you actually manage to do it? You are still in school. Tell us a little bit more about your background and how you get time to play this amazing game. I actually don't play that much. It's a weird thing. I play weekly armories. I have one armory a week at my local store that I play. And then I go to the different, like when there's a skirmish season, I try to go to one or two skirmishes and then the road to nationals go to that. And then all those things, pro quest and stuff. But I don't do online events ever. I don't really enjoy that part of Flesh and Blood. I just feel like it should be played Flesh and Blood for me. 
as the name suggests. I just, I don't enjoy the online part, but I really do the, the in-person part. So I try that as much as possible. I have been very lucky to be, to have played Magic the Gathering for a lot of time. So I developed a lot of the, what do you call that? The, uh, the fundamental card game skills before I even started Flesh and Blood. And then you, know, you just transfer those over to Flesh and Blood and then apply them in the way that it makes sense here. And then you got a head start on the game. So I have that. I guess that's why I still can keep up in the game. But uh, yeah, I don't play that much, but I play as much as I can find time for. So we haven't really seen you at the bigger tournaments this year. But as you said, you are trying to keep up with the game at a pace that is doable for you. And what really makes choosing a hero for you when going to the next tournament, which was the last one, the Calling Birmingham for you? How do you choose your hero? It I think there is a very fine balance in the game between the heroes you like and the heroes that are best because generally in certain metas there will be a couple decks that are at the top it generally won't be just one deck but just a couple decks like two or three four decks that are quite good for that meta and i think it's important to play one of those decks if you're intending to do well at a tournament and uh, being honest i don't think katsu is one of those decks right now and the reason why i don't think katsu is one of those decks is because he breaks too much And that means that either his hands don't do enough because he didn't draw the right combination of cards, or he's not good enough at blocking because so many of his cards block too that when he needs to block because of an unhit effect, he just can't do it efficiently. And I think that is what's holding him back. I remember back in the day, this is another thing about Katsu, where you played a sort of turtle Katsu. You played a lot of defense reactions and then a lot of cards that block three because then you could switch a little bit between attacking and blocking. It worked back in the day, but we're in a meta right now where it just doesn't make sense anymore because decks are a little bit too efficient, at least the top decks. Now that's why I don't think he's the best choice right now, and I didn't go for him. The reason I mentioned earlier is that I like to play new decks a lot of the time because I just need to play something new to, to figure something else out that I haven't played before. And I started playing Garden a lot recently. Just when Olden was going out, I started playing him which is a bit of a bad time, but then I had to switch over <laughs> to someone else. So I switched over to Bravo, tried to play him a little bit. And uh, I like the playstyle because he's very efficient at using all of his hands. So this is for all the Flesh and Blood players that are frustrated that they are playing Viscera and where you just draw a brick hand and everything goes to waste. Or you're playing Brood and you just don't like rolling dice. Play Bravo because all of his hands just work. But there's, there's just no hand that you can draw on Bravo that doesn't work except for a red hand. It's just he is so efficient and everything work in his hand. It's just you block, swing the hammer, or you take some damage, then you dominate a crew. It's just, you can't have a bad hand in Bravo. It's very difficult. And that is what I like about him because it gives a lot of player agency. And that is also the big part of why I chose Bravo for the event because he is a bit of a mid-range mid control deck. And I believe that when there is a lot of player agency for a hero, where The player piloting the hero has agency in controlling the game, blocking and attacking. The skill difference between two players playing will show more in that. So when I'm playing a hero that I think is, is a bit of a control deck and has I have more agency in controlling the outcome of the game, I believe that I win more against players of a lower skill level. If I played, for example, a fight deck where the opponent is also playing a deck that is an aggro deck, If we're just trying to smash our faces against each other and then see who is better, then be my what I, I might be my better skill level might not come across. And so that is why I chose Bravo for the It's a combination of novelty and skill difference, at least what I'm trying to get out in the games, the skill difference that I hope I have against my opponent. And a meta choice, because I believed I had a good Bravo deck against the top two decks, the Lexis and... And you didn't even think of one second, why didn't I choose Katsu? Because you actually saw some Katsu in the tournament and even one that you faced in top eight. So there wasn't like one drop of, ah, I could have. No, I never considered Katsu for the event. Never even for one second. The decks that I tested before were a bit of Dromai, just a slight bit of Dromai, and then Bravo and a bit of Icelander and... I feel like there was one other hero, but apparently they're too insignificant for me to remember. So Icelander, Bravo, and uh, a little bit of Dromai. And then I didn't test Lexi because I just didn't want to play Lexi. Because I wanted to try to not be the deck that came there to be, try to be the deck to beat that deck. And also I don't own any nature <laughs> cards, so it would have been a hassle to assemble the deck. And at least you could sleeve up your Bravo in a Katsu dress. 
at least precisely. <laughs> so I think it's pretty interesting what you just touched on with your last sentence, because you are actually testing not only for different heroes from tournament to tournament, but you are considering different angles of the game pretty much in every situation. And how do you manage to keep up with this? There are as you mentioned the possibilities of playing online but that's not really for you and how do you really play test and have all these cards to play with first touching quickly on the online part again i think if you want to test out a deck before you buy it online is a great way to do it tally shard is one possibility then there's tabletop simulator i actually prefer tabletop simulator because that platform makes you remember your triggers and char does not and char you're just like cruise through the game you're a baby by the char client and then also sometimes there are bugs in the char that makes things go wrong but on tabletop simulator you're playing more as if it was a real game so i like that platform i think it's a good way to test decks and i also do it with my friends okay. sometimes where we play tabletop if it's not possible to meet up in person or we need some more games for a turn so i think it is a good valid option to do that and i think it's important for testing especially if you have groups that are not living close by uh, then with the collection part yeah It can be really tough to keep up with a collection where you can play multiple decks. But the thing with Flesh and Blood is you go into a rabbit hole at some point where you buy one deck and then now I own a tunic. That's one third of another deck. So, you know, I might as well just buy this other deck now. And then once you buy that deck, well, now you have the E-Strikes too. So, you know, you might as well just buy the other deck because all the expensive cards are generic anyways and legendary. So then you just buy another deck and then all of a sudden you have four decks and then you have five decks and then you have six decks. I would consider myself what we TCG players call whales, right? Where you just buy a lot of cards and you just have a really big collection. And that is not for everybody because everybody doesn't have uh, money allocated for that. And it, it depends on how many hobbies also you have or you have different things you like doing. Everything costs money. You can't have everything. But it depends on what you want, right? So if you really like Flesh and Blood and you enjoy playing a lot of different heroes, then that might be a good thing but you just upgrade your collection slowly you make trades and sell the cards you don't want in case you don't want to play some heroes and then slowly you generally get there but then you can also just you can buy one deck and then play that deck and then try to make the best of that deck every meta that's also fine just it means that you shouldn't expect to win grand tournaments every meta because that hero is not going to be the best deck ever so it's just meeting the expectations that you have And yeah, using your strategy, building a path according to that, according to what you want. And there are, as you already said, like there are some cards that you don't have. Like why, why did you choose to not get some of the cards? I hate rolling dice to determine my games of flesh and blood. So I don't play food. I don't like that. I, I have a really good friend at the store he also went with me to birmingham he's a really good guy but he just he only plays brood pretty much shout him. he really loves <laughs> levaya yeah shout out to him oh yeah he plays a lot of levaya even back when she was still garbage and she i think she's still garbage though but back when she was even more garbage he played her all along and now she got more cards and she just still doesn't work <laughs> i don't think but he is trying his best to make her work so it's nice and he enjoys the hero but i just can't the scatskin leathers the random discards I just can't do that. It just doesn't work for me. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then Ranger, that's more just personal spite. I just don't, I don't like Ranger. Ranger is a good class right now. God, Ranger is yeah. really good. Like on the border of being broken, there are only like a couple decks that sort of keep me like in line from being broken. I think Lexi is like gatekeeping a lot of aggro decks in Flesh and Blood right now. I think she's a really strong deck. I just don't like her, so I don't play her. And then when we look at Bravo, the deck that she actually played at the calling, it's also, would you say, is that a good deck for a person that does this and didn't really get to play Bravo? Is it pretty easy from the card perspective to get into that deck? Oh, you mean in terms of uh, yes, price? Yes, that's right. In terms of price. Ooh. I think that depends on the, the cards you put in the deck. The Crown of Providence just yeah. got reprinted, way more accessible now. Tectonic plating is not that bad either. So the equipment suite is actually not that bad. And then obviously you don't have to play Heart of Yandal. That was a better choice. <laughs> yeah. Don't have to play that. And then, uh, yeah, then you have Command and Conquerors, then some Browse the Ancients, and then just a bunch of random cards pretty much. So yeah, Bravo is actually a fairly cheap deck for someone who is new to the game. Oh, obviously. Oh, sorry, forgot. Warmonger's Diplomacy. <laughs> That's a meta choice for sure. <laughs> yeah, that card blew up after the event. It was already yes. expensive before. It was like 30 euros in card market. Now it's like 50. <laughs> it's insane. 
And I will tell you guys, I did not play Warmonger's Diplomacy one single time during the whole tournament. <laughs> yeah. It was just a block three blue card. <laughs> but I think also the, the power of it is a little bit overrated right now, although it's quite free to play in your deck. I think it's pretty much only good against Viserai right now, because I think Briar has changed her whole deck to not get as shit on by it, the diplomacy. But then by doing that, I has made her deck worse just by the existence of Warmonger's Diplomacy, and now her deck is bad. So that's just great for everybody who doesn't play Briar. And then Viserai, he can't really make his deck work around it, so he just loses to it when Warmonger's Diplomacy hits the field. I think it's absolute copium not to say that Viserai gets absolutely trashed off by Warmonger's <laughs> yeah. Diplomacy. But then every other class, I don't really... I think they actually have good tools for building around it. I think Lexi, as long as you're a good Lexi player, you don't really get hit by War Warmonger's Diplomacy. And then same for us. If you're a good at play, don't get hit by Warmonger's Diplomacy. So I think in that case, it's just a skill issue. It's just if you're a good Lexi and SA player, you know how to play around it and build your deck effectively. Around it. I think it's actually only a dry yeah. card right now against that deck. So you don't need that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You don't need to pay then. 150 yeah. euro for it. It's fine. You don't need that to start. But then the rest of the deck is really not that expensive. Yeah. So yeah, and then the expensive cards you're buying are generally generics that you can use for every deck. But the deck is also not that like difficult to learn in terms of its play lines. So I think that's also a good thing for new players. Or if you want to try out another yeah. class, you can generally get into the groove of playing a Guardian pretty easily. The only rule of thumb that I would give you if you want to play Guardian is... You need to block more than you think. Because Guardian is good at blocking, and you need to use Hammer that. for four. Exactly. Block Hammer for four. It's a classic. It's a classic for a reason. Yeah. And then don't overvalue the Dominate on Bravo. A lot of the time, Bravo is just flavor text. And then sometimes the money yeah. matters. Actually, yeah. I think we can bring up your deck for a second because the deck, even though it is very similar to the one that... Pablo was also playing and already showed on Push the Point. But definitely check that out if you haven't already. But we can look at your list and I think bring one or two spotlights on a few cards that you actually choose to put in and can give people with on their way when they want to play Bravo in the future on why you actually decided to put these cards in and how they turned out in the tournament. Yeah. I think those cards are mainly in the sideboard, right? Yeah, so I have the like main board up top, which is like the cards I pretty much always play. The sideboard, cards that I bring in depending yeah. on the matchup. So in the sideboard, which cards actually do you think are something that people can take away with? Oh, take out of the sideboard. Uh, or, no, uh... I take away from the video, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so interesting cards in the sideboard. Down and Dirty. So you would look at Down and Dirty and think, yeah, why is this in the list? Then you think, all right, oh my, obviously. But it's actually not, oh my, that was the reason why I put in the Down and Dirty. It was Lexi Fatigue. Because I am trying every time I play this to fatigue Lexi. And Down and Dirty means that Codex of Frailty does not discard a card from my hand and force me to put a card in my arsenal that I don't want to put there. So Down and Dirty allows me to fatigue Lexi without having to worry about Codex of Frailty. And then also, obviously, it's good against Stromai. But yeah, Down and Dirty has actually been very good against Fatiguing Lexi because it's probably, on average, throughout games, gained me two to four life, like each game, from being brought back and then blocking. Yeah. So it's been a very good card at that. Then, then I believe another difference between our list is the Pulverize. The Pulverize I played as a one heave card that you could find with showtime yeah. so it was in the deck for the matchups where i actually wanted to kill my opponent and then wanted a good turn one play or turn zero play rather. but this is also a card that's not necessary in the deck then the heart of fiendel yeah that's that's a spicy one it's like 550 dollars or something for gain one life it's pretty nice but uh, yep this is also a fatigue card so i only need one card in my deck to beat alexi and that could just be heart of fiendel so i found that this card generally or across a game will be pitched like two to three times against Alexi, and it will then gain me three life. So that's three free life against Alexi, which is crucial in some games because they might be able to push a good amount of damage against you. And it's just basically assurance that you can fatigue them. And then the last spicy one, the hold the line. Oh, one, which I was really surprised to see that you was only running one of. Yeah, just the one, because it doesn't really synergize with the rest of the deck in terms of having three cost and Brock three. So it only really does something on the turn where an opponent would draw two or more cards. Then it's really good though. And that is relevant against three of a kind. So that is also a fatigue card. But then I also 
brought it in against the matchups where I just wanted 41 blues and then tried to line up three blue, dominate a crippling crush or a starstruck or something like that. So it served a double purpose, but it was a card intended for fatiguing Lexi. Also some general notes about the deck right now, because this deck was a building mess, I would say, <laughs> up to the tournament, because I was, I didn't really know what to do about the whole build in general, because I was very worried about Icelander winning two battle hardens in a row before this tournament, because I knew this deck needs all of these cards to fatigue Alexi bringing in like 69 cards. I need 70 cards in my deck to make sure that that, that happens every time. But if I need that many cards in my deck that I can put in that block three, that make sure that I don't die against Alexi, my Icelander matchup is just garbage. And I was sitting trying to figure out if I could somehow make my Icelander matchup good and still have all these cards against Alexi. And I, before the tournament, when I was sitting at the hotel the day before, I just went, no, this is not happening. I'm not gonna beat Lexi every time and also beat Icelander. So I just gave up on the Icelander matchup. And in general, not completely, I could still win it, but I think it's like maybe a 20% for the deck. 15-20%, it's not very likely. It's not very favorite at all. So I just said that that's okay. That's what I'm dealing with. I'm gonna have a good matchup into the two most played decks and then generally all other matchups are pretty good as well. And that is a general thing that you also have to do when you build for tournaments and metas. Generally, there won't be a deck that beats every single thing in a field. So you'll have to choose what things you want to beat the most. And sometimes it's worth more to get more percentage points in a matchup that's already good than try to get small percentage points in a matchup that's bad. So for example, I could make the fatigue plan against Lexi and I could essentially win against Lexi 99% of the time. And it's better for me to win against Lexi 99% of the time than for me to win against Lexi 50% of the time and rate my Ice Snyder matchups from 15% to 25%, if that makes sense. I gain more percentage point against Lexi, which is also a more represented deck than getting smaller percentage points against yeah. Icelander, even though it's a bad matchup. So I chose to get all my percentage points in the most represented matchups rather than taking four Icelander. And when preparing for, for my next tournaments of course, Nationals is yeah. coming up very soon, I am definitely not going to be playing this exact list. And who even knows, maybe I won't even play Bravo. I haven't decided yet, but I will be making changes accordingly, right? Because now Icelander won another premier event that they also won like the PTI <laughs> event like this last weekend. Like they, they're just winning left <laughs> and right. So I might make changes to the deck, right? The thing that is very good against Icelander, Celis Belting. And I ran E-Strike instead because it yeah. was a block three. And so it's better against uh, Lexi. That is also a difference, I but, think, in your and Pablo's list, right? Yeah, exactly. The E-Strike. And E-Strike is worse to play than Celis Belting. Enlightened Strike blocks three. And that was just important to sure up the Lexi matchup. If I'm building against a field that I expect to be more Icelander, I will definitely not be playing the Heart of Fiendel. I might not play the Hold the Line. I will not be playing the E-Strike. I might probably won't play the Pulverize either. I will put in Celis Beltings and I will put in what I think actually is the most important card against Icelander, the Fiendel Spring Tunic. If you want to win against Icelander on Bravo, you need to play Spring Tunic. I don't think you're going to have a good matchup against Icelander if you don't mm. play Spring Tunic because your tectonic plating is just very bad. When you spend one mana to make the Seismic Surge, Icelander gets an opportunity window to disrupt you before you get to do other things. It's very bad. And then on top of that, when your Seismic Surge activates during your next turn, they get a window to do something there as well. So they get to double disrupt you when you use the Tectonic Plating. It's just very bad. Where on the other hand, Tunic allows you to get one resource at critical moments, which stops Icelander from disrupting you. It's really so bad that when, you, when I play Tectonic Plating into Icelander, that the matchup feels like a 15%. But when you play Tunic into Icelander, and then AB2, like B2 Tunic and Celis Beltings and two Pummels in the deck, then the matchup feels like a 60 to 65% in favor of Bravo. So don't necessarily need that much to make the matchup into something that is favored, but it's just very difficult when you're building a deck that is so fine on the line as this, when you need 70 cards to fatigue Alex. So it's, it's difficult to fit everything into a list. It's the point. And sometimes you have to choose yeah, the lesser of the two yeah. evils. Is there anything else that you want to mention on the list before we come to your experience on the tournament? I think everything else is very standard. The Blue yeah. Fiendos Fighting Spirit, that was the tech that Pablo was also on. And I remember very distinctly after Pablo and I played, another player who was spectating us play came up to Pablo and asked him why he was playing the card. And then he explained why he was playing the card. 
And then he looked to me and pointed to me and said, this guy knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a tech also against Lexi because you can block the five attack breakpoints and then you gain one life because you're behind on life. You're trying to fatigue them. But yeah, it's not always a good card. Don't always play this card, but it was good against Lexi. So again, that's part of being like following the meta and being, let's say, self-thinking <laughs> when you're building a deck. Think about odd choices that might give you small advantages. And this is the sort of choice that will give you small advantages against Lexi. Okay, so I I remember you also said like you are not testing with Pablo at all. So it's quite no. of an interesting uh, track down that you both came up with a similar list and also with some um, really the same text in there. I think Starstruck was also a card that not everybody was expecting to be that good before the tournament. But I want to close down the yeah the deck profile the deck list show up here with Wombonga's diplomacy once again because when somebody is watching that thinks of okay this list without all the expensive cards how would you replace like a card like Wombonga's diplomacy here because you already mentioned that this card wasn't really that amazing as so many players think it is basically a blue three block here for you at the tournament what would you replace this card with when you don't want to spend the money for it yeah if you're just building this deck and you don't have diplomacies i think that's fair i remember even another story from the event that samuel the winner of the calling he didn't play warmonger's diplomacy in his deck because he said he couldn't afford to get them and he still won the tournament that should just show how necessary the card actually is in the deck it's not necessary but it will give you small percentage points against uh some lesser represented decks but if you want to replace it you can play just almost any other block three blue cost three card Ooh, i remember all the card names but something like stamp authority mm -hmm. you could play that you could also play the card that grabs an aura from your deck cost three and x whatever that <laughs> card is called and then other cards that just cost three are blue and block three they will just fill in the spot yeah. perfectly yeah. all right so yeah all right come back to this view yeah we already touched a little bit on your experience on the tournament you told us some insights on it already but let's go through it a little bit more structured so when you entered the tournament day one what exactly were you thinking about the tournament which did you had any expectations or what are you of a player like how do you go in this kind of tournaments generally i try not to have any expectations for the whole tournament because you never know what's going to happen. I could just have met two Icelanders round one and round two and then just being like, okay, I guess that's it. But you just try to take every game as the game comes. I, I think I heard Brody say this before, that you just don't think about the results as they, they come. You just think about the game right now as you're playing it. Because you can't control every result that happens in Flesh and Blood because there is variance in the game. So you just have to trust that the testing you did and the deck you came up with is and that you did the right choices. And if you didn't, then this is what you have right now and you have to play with what you have. So you have to make the best of what you're, you're dealt with right now. So that is generally how I approach every game in the tournament. I think about what's happening right now. And then in between rounds, of course, if I won, I'm very happy to go to my friends, talk about that. But then next round, when I sit down, I try to just have the same mindset again, not thinking about the result of the game, but thinking about every single play that I make in the game. Right. And touching on the first day, like what exactly were your matchups? What heroes did you face off? Oh, just as intended. Five <laughs> Lexis, one Droma and one Bravo. Tell me a little bit more about so it. I sat down the first round. My opponent said Lexi. I smile a little bit, sat down, fatigued them. <laughs> Next round, sat down again. They said Lexi, smile a little bit again, sat down, lean back, fatigued them again. Then played a Droma, or did the same thing, and then three more Lexis, and then a Bravo to end it on, on the six no yeah. table. That, that was a very good day one. I was very pleased with the matchups and they were the most two represented decks, the Droma and the Lexi. So it's not all too uncommon, but meeting six of those two decks was very good for me. And they were what I tested for. It was a good matchup. So I was very happy about that. So you were pretty confident going into day two then, I think. I knew that going into day two, the other two 7-0 players were Dash and Tatsu. <laughs> so no no Lexis, no Romais. So that was going to be a different matchup. I knew I wasn't super unfavored into Dash, but I was a little bit unfavored. 40, 45% ish into Dash. And then Katsu. I think I am I'm favored because I've played a lot of Katsu, but I don't think you're necessarily favored if you have don't understand Katsu. But then I got matched up against the Dash. 
So I thought, okay, that's going to be a little bit of tough matchup, but it's possible. But then things lined up. I got some good dominates, like the three blue and then seven mana big crush card in my hand. So I could dominate, play that card. Got a lot of those, which was very fortunate. And then uh, my opponent's defense reactions did line up super well. He had some in the early turns, but then he had a drought in the mid game where he didn't draw that many defense reactions. So I got to land a lot of the crush effects that made him discard cards were not able to play his turns and, and I got very far ahead so that he couldn't catch up in the late game. Although it wasn't favor, it ended up in my favor in the end, which was fortunate. And then I got to play some Katsu as well in the day two, and that was nice. Very fun to play against Katsu. Got to line up a lot of three and then crush effect against Katsu as well. Katsu couldn't block that at all. So Katsu just crumbled to that and then played against an Asuri in the last round, another Lexi and a Pablo on Bravo. And how, the, how did the, all these games turn out? I, I lost yeah. to Pablo and then I won yeah. all the other games. So you were one of the players to watch out for top eight for sure. And on the quarterfinals, you met your hero. You faced against Katsu again, like... I saw that match myself. What were the key moments on the game for you, though? Well, at the start of the game, the whole thing changed on its head because my opponent presented Sephir Needle, and there had been a new ruling for Sephir Needle, apparently, with the rules replies, which changed the ruling of the card. And I didn't know that, and my opponent did not know that either. So at some point, he attacked with it. He has a, had a razor, razor reflex in hand, and I just blocked the Sephir Needle. Going, yeah, it's fine. He's, uh, he razor reflexes it, right? And we continue on with the turn, and then he stops the chain starts pulling it back, no one's saying anything, but then the judge intervenes and says it's supposed to be destroyed. And I don't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand what's going on. So the judge looks it up and sure as he said, it's supposed to be destroyed. So it's destroyed. And I just know from that point on that my whole game plan is just going to be blocking now because he can't fatigue me ever with one Kodachi. So I just need to block and make sure that his concealed blades don't hit. So he, he can't re-equip another Kodachi. And that's what I do for the rest of the game. And yeah, I managed to fatigue him in the end. And also the whole, hold the line came up pretty nicely in that game too. Yeah, I wasn't even intending it for Art of War. I was trying just to hide it for the, the Concealed Blade. But when he played the last Art of War there and then drew two cards, I knew that, oh, he just fatigued himself even more. I just need to play the hold the line. And then, yeah, that sure up that yeah. turn. But it felt pretty good for sure. And after you won that game, it was time to face up Icelander. Did you actually think of a chance of winning that game i knew it was going to be very rough and i was i needed to get lucky to win the game and i, I did get pretty lucky in the start of the game i had a good i, I started turn zero because i got to choose first player so i had a um, three blue crippling crush hand so i got to deal him like eight damage on turn one so he went to 28 <coughs> which was nice that was really nice that was best possible starting hand probably but then after that the game just went like down I, like i couldn't assemble hands that dealt enough damage and he could just disrupt my turn very well and deal me chip damage because I only had AB1. Yeah, and then that then things just didn't work out. He killed me from eight with like AB with a blue in hand at some point during the late game with like double Emerita scolding. Yeah, that, I mean, it's pretty much how I expected the game to go, but it was actually close. Yeah, I, I mentioned this earlier about the Tunic, but I think an important thing about the Icelander matchup is that AB3 is not necessary because you sitting back and being all their stuff is just going to let them win eventually because they're going to assemble insidious chills then they're going to yeah. kill you so you need to kill them fast so i think the correct play into icelander is tuning ab2 and then keep the uh, block two gloves because they can gain you three okay. life against the bull lander yeah because you don't really ever want to ab on their turn you don't want to discard cards you just want to kill them so ab2 for your turn and then tunic is the best option if you want to beat icelanders yeah so that was pretty much all of your games in the calling birmingham you went home with money too, that's amazing. Do you spend it on cards or what are you doing with it? No, I'm just going to yeah. save it. I already spent four, four cards before the tournament. I'm just going to use it for traveling to Barcelona yeah. for Worlds and maybe buy some bright lights just to have some new cards before the Worlds yeah. tournament. Let's actually touch yeah. on bright lights for a second. What are your impressions on bright lights? I think it's a very interesting take on a flesh and blood set because now we only have a focus on one class, which means that the, the limited portion of events will be very different. I'm not sure how draft is going to work exactly in that set. And the same with sealed, like how are the games going to be impacted by only having one class? It's going to be very different than what we previously experienced. And then also how it's going to impact the constructing. Because we're going to get a set with a ton of Mechanologist cards. And Mechanologist is already not too bad of a class in the game. So how much power is Mechanologist going to get 
from this set is possibly worrying me a little bit. <laughs> but I think LS has gotten very good at balancing cards, maybe even underbalancing cards, because I think the last couple sets have been very low in power level, except for Ranger and Outsiders. They pumped the Ranger <laughs> and Outsiders. Everybody else has been very low in power level in general throughout the last couple sets. So I think they're going to manage pretty well. I really like the extra slot in yeah. the boosters that appear like every 15 packs with cards that are not necessarily mechanologists because that could add very important cards for other classes that could be make their decks better. I remember someone talked about guardian shoes at some point, like pieces, and that would be very nice. I wouldn't say to that. Bravo can get some new shoes, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just shoes the block two. Ask me for much. <laughs> AB would be good too, right? Oh yeah, of course. Block yeah, two, yeah. AB one. <laughs> yeah, I think I also want to hear your opinion on going into the next month because you already mentioned that you want to go to Worlds. You will be participating in Nationals. You also touched on your strategy for Nationals a little bit, but let's actually talk about Nationals from a personal standpoint. For nationals in Denmark, what does that mean for you participating in your home country? It means that I am very worried about losing rating, uh, for sure. Because with the call in Birmingham, I managed to, to get enough rating to, uh, to get into the top 50 uh, constructed rating, which is very fortunate. But in Denmark, people don't all like necessarily go out of country to play that much. So we don't have that much collective rating. So going to nationals, I'm definitely going to put on my mean face and bring a deck that I believe is good. Because I think any loss is going to be a lot of rating down. And is there any like particular deck that is favored at the moment in Denmark? Like what, what kind of decks do then Denmark players like to play? Denmark players like to play a lot of stuff. I don't even know what to say for the meta here. I believe there are a lot of uh, Draw My Prison players, so I'm certain there will be some Draw Mice there. We have a lot of Lexi players that played Lexi even when she was uh, when she was bad before Outsiders, and I'm certain there will be quite a few of them still bringing Lexi to the tournament. Then probably a couple of Bravos, maybe one of Suri, two Icelanders. There is there are a lot of different things. Probably no Kano. <laughs> okay, maybe one. <laughs> maybe one. Probably not. <laughs> I don't think so, because oh. the Kano players that I know have already said they're playing right. other decks. So, yeah, I don't think any players will join. <laughs> All right, then let's come to the last big event this year, the World Championship. Pablo's home country. So it will be very interesting to see from different perspectives how this tournament will go out. How do you view the World Championship? I am just really happy it's in Europe, because that's going to make the travel very easy for the rest of us people in Scandinavia. It was, it was also nice last year. San Jose was very fun to travel to, but it was a long journey and I could not convince any of my friends to come along because they didn't want to travel all that way for a calling. So I had to travel there by myself and then met up with some of the other Nordic players, Oscar from Norway and then Miko and Mikael from, from Finland. And that was really fun though, because then when you don't travel with your buddies necessarily, like the people you talk to on a normal basis, then you meet other players. Got to become very good friends with some Norwegian players and Finnish players that I wouldn't have otherwise. And uh, yeah, if American players this time, you're wondering about traveling, but uh, you don't have any people that are going because they're maybe not qualified for Worlds, then uh, don't be afraid to reach out and meet some other players because I can guarantee you it's it's going to turn out well. So you're going to be welcomed by players and it's very fun, but I am very excited. It's going to be a really good Worlds this year. For Definitely, sure. yes. As you just mentioned, the Nordic flesh and blood scene, as it is called, it's a very interesting community to be in so what does it mean to be part of that community and getting to know well, the, like you said finland sweden and so on the players are very active in trying to knit each other together and meet each other when going to these larger tournaments and there is a group for the like nordic players where people like write about tournaments and strategies and talk and organize drafts online and i think that's a really nice thing because making a team that's spanning like the whole of the North. It's a really big task. It's really satisfying when it works because you just get to get so many opinions from players in other countries where the meta might be different or the thought pattern of how to play a deck might be different. And it really helps elevate all the players that are part of that. And I really enjoy that. And then when you go to the tournaments, you have even more people that are rooting for you and you're rooting for them. And it's just a really nice experience being part of that group and then knowing yeah. people. So it will be very interesting to see at Nationals who then becomes king in the north of flesh and blood. Yeah, we'll see. There will be, be some new kings. <laughs> who knows who they'll be. I think from my side, I have 
all questions done. Do you want to include anything that is on your mind? Just I hope that if you can, if it's manageable, that you come to the Worlds in Barcelona because it's gonna be awesome. And then if at any point you want to come up and talk or you have anything to say, feel free to. I'm sure Alex will say the yes, same thing. Yes, for sure. Everybody that's watching yeah. is in to come over, for sure. For sure. Yeah, also do you want to shout out anyone? Oh, for sure. The brew player I was talking about earlier, Klaus. Klaus Post. Yeah, shout out to him for being a great brew player. He's, he's the real chat. And then another player from the local scene, Yebe. He was trying to get me to play Lexi. <laughs> All of the testing <laughs> up for Birmingham. And he almost convinced me at some point, but then I went, no, I'm playing Bravo, I'm playing Bravo. But shout out to him, man, he's a good guy. And then the rest of the team, I got a question, got Raspus, got Nikolai from the local scene, got all sorts of good players here. And then other players from other cities. Man, we got a lot of good ones. It's really, really good to be here. All right. Guys, everybody that is watching at this point, I want to thank you for joining in and staying on that long and hope to see you at the bigger tournaments this year, like Nationals or at Worlds, Sebastian said. Let's have a chat for sure. And Sebastian, thank you so much for taking the time, talking about your experience at the Calling Birmingham and giving us some insights on your tactics for Flesh and Blood. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you.